today's guest is Thais Sines. She's the founder of Sines Global. Thais, thank you, thank you for coming on the show. Of course, it's my pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. So you told me a very interesting story before we got on air about, you know, sort of your early years, like where you were born and and that story there. Can you share with the audience uh, what that was? Yeah, absolutely. So I was actually born in a hut in the middle of the Brazilian Amazon jungle. Um, so my parents got married really young and then decided to go help the Chicuna tribes. Um, so they went and were there and then they got pregnant and then had me literally in the middle of the Amazon jungle. So if you go to a map and you look up the Amazon, you're going to see that the capital of the Brazilian Amazon is Manaus, which is a huge city. Um, so to get to where I was born, it would take you five days on a boat. So from the Am Manaus, the capital, you take a boat and it takes you five full days to get to Benjamin Constant. Um, this place was so small back in the day that you couldn't even see it on a map, but now you can. So yes, that is where I was born. I was born in a non-traditional way, in a hut, no doctors, and um, in the middle of the Amazon jungle. So it's pretty neat. And wow. I have pictures to prove it too. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is awesome. I love that. And yeah. then you mentioned something, um, you, you, you then um, moved to Mexico, is that? Yes. So my parents then decided to go to, they got like a scholarship to go study in the city of Mexico, El DF, El Distrito Federal. And so then when I was three years old, I moved to Mexico City. And so kind of went from the jungle of the Amazon to if you know Mexico City, it is like this crazy jungle of a city, right? Like huge buildings, lots of people. Back in the day, it used to be the most polluted place in the world. Um, so it just went through two different crazy, um, you know, two different jungles. And so I loved Mexico. I say I'm Brazilian by blood, but Mexican by heart. Uh, Cause that's kind of where I learned my Spanish, uh, went to my first, you know, schools and also love, and I love Mexican food, anything Mexicano, I'm all about it. So I'm really grateful for Mexico. I learned Spanish, which I absolutely love speaking. Awesome. You're doing something fairly entrepreneurial now, but in the early days, were there any signs of this entrepreneurial spirit? Yes. So my mom says you were always into selling, like you always wanted to do business. She said when we would go back to the jungle, so we would go back to the Amazon jungle when we moved to America, and we would take like dentists and nurses and doctors on these boats to go into the middle of the Amazon jungle and to help um, the tribe people, right, with medicine and like medical help. And the tribal ladies would always make these beautiful jewelries made out of beads from fruits and all of these things. And they obviously could not speak, communicate with in English to, um, you know, vice versa. So I would say, okay, how, how much do you want to sell these? And they say, yes, I want to sell my jewelry. And I'm like, good. And they would be like, I want to sell it for a dollar. And I'm like, no, we, we can do better. We got this. So I would go and just like help all of the tribal ladies, like sell their jewelry to the, the doctors and the nurses. And they were beautiful things. And so I always did that. Or when I was little, my mom said I would go to school and I would ask her to buy things at Costco, like a ton of candy and chips and, and, you know, pens and pencils. And I would dish them out at school and sell them. So she always said, you were always trying to come up with something to sell. So yes, that's, since childhood, I guess. That's awesome. And then um, uh, was, was uh, Nordstrom, so your, your early sales ro rolls out of uh, university? Yeah. So when I was in university, I was actually went to a really, really small school in Waxahachie, Texas. Um, and it is super small. And I got, and I wanted to in intern in like a big company, a fortune 500, right? So Nordstrom back in the, like, is still a great company. Um, when it came to um, internships, they actually did paid internships. And at the time I was in Dallas, Texas, and there is um, a Nordstrom there that's called North Park. So North Park um, Mall Shopping Center has the like highest revenue store. So I think that we were doing like a million a week, like really high level. Um, so they had an internship program. And so I applied like from this small, tiny little school and they had thousands of applicants and I got in and I was with a bunch of other 10 other you know, 10 other interns, but they were all from big universities, like University of Florida, uh, you know, University of Austin, like all of these different schools. And there I was with this tiny little school, but I loved it. I was, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. And 
I loved working with Nordstrom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was the key lesson? I mean, I'm, I'm sure they had lots of um, processes and, and systems. Yes. One of the best things about that internship was the manager of that store. So I, she was highly respected, but highly loved. So it was almost this thing that I had never seen before. Usually people like hate the person who's leading, right? But they, everyone loved her, but they highly respected her. So everyone did their position well because they wanted to make her proud. And she was so good at being, um, you know, like, intentional of like seeing how everyone is doing, but also elevating everyone to a higher level. So it was such a great store because the level of expert, like we had to bring it up. Like there was no, she didn't tolerate anything less, but we all loved her. So it was this beautiful dynamic of you can really respect someone, want to do your best for them and yet still really like them and love them. So it was pretty neat to learn that. Wow. And then from there, where did you go? So while I was working at Nordstrom, I got recruited. Um, So I worked at Nordstrom as an intern, and then they hired me on to be part of their management team. And while I was working there, I got recruited by a stainless steel company. So mind you, I have no idea anything about stainless steel. So I got recruited by a client that would come to the store and um, to another, uh, like before when I was in college, I was working at an even smaller store. So she kept um, recruiting me saying, hey, you should come work for my company. You speak three languages. We, she said, we uh, manufacture stainless steel equipment for McDonald's franchises and a bunch of franchises. And I was like, I have no idea about any of that. Like that does not interest me at all. Um, But she kept pursuing me and was like, listen, you are missing the opportunity of your lifetime if you don't come. So I then had started working with Nordstrom and I was like, no, I definitely don't want to keep going out. Like this lady keeps pursuing me. Um, But then I, you know, as the last message she sent me and she said, listen, this is the last time I'm going to reach out to you, but you are missing the opportunity of your lifetime. If you don't come just meet with us. And so I, at the time, um, was like, okay, I'm going to give her a call. So I called her and, um, I went and, you know, met with the company and pretty much that kind of changed my whole life. (laughs) So what did you learn through, uh, that company in the various roles? So I was in charge of all of Latin America. So I was 24 years old and I was, you know, had this management position. I kind of jumped in, like not realizing like the, the gravity of like what I was doing. Um, they were like, okay, here's Latin America, like all of South, the Caribbean central. Now your goal is to make these clients buy more from us. And so I guess I'm just entrepreneurial, you know, by spirit. And I was like, all right, let's do this. So I would travel to all the countries, meet all of the clients. And just get them to love us so that they could work with us. And so um, I learned all about stainless. I learned all about, um, you know, when it comes to the importance of collaborating with, you know, architects and, you know, uh, fabrication and vendors and buyers and sellers and all of it um, and exporting internationally. So learned tons of things I never thought I was going to do. So I learned so much with that company. 100% it was amazing. Yeah, you, you said something because, you know, travel, go there and make make them love us. How did you do that? What were some of the things you uh, implemented or subtleties there? So one thing I think from, you know, growing up and traveling a lot. So I grew, tra- grew up traveling the world when I was young. Um, people are all different. So everyone has their own DNA, right? And every culture is special in their own way, right? So when I traveled to Korea, it was a lot different than when I traveled to Guatemala, right? Um, And everyone has their own Um, their own way of receiving like respect and care. And so what I would do a lot of times when I would travel is always kind of read up. Um, And also just because I've had a lot of international connections and friendships, I'm able to go, okay, in this situation, when I go visit my clients in Chile, right? The best thing to do is to bring them something like this or get to know them. You know, if I'm in, you know, wherever part of the world, I would kind of learn a little bit more about the culture and see how I could come in respectfully showing them that we're really, you know, we want to work with them and that we're here to serve them, but um, to partner with them. So it's just learning about people and uh, the ability to connect with people. That's really how we made them love us, connect with people and let them know that they can trust you and show them that you are trusted worthy. So that's how we won over the market. It's pretty awesome. Wow. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and then to your current venture, where you're providing admin services to the roofing industry, how, how did that happen? 
Yeah. So that's another crazy story, but I love stories, right? So I was listening to, so I've been with um, the company I was with for eight and a half years, um, had a really successful career. Like I actually had gotten promoted at the time um, and went to the whole Florida market. Um, and Florida it actually almost has more restaurants in the franchise uh, that I was working with than all of Latin America. So that just tells you how huge Florida was. And at the time, Florida belonged wholly to our um, competitor. So they're like, will you go? And I was already living in South Florida. And they're like, will you now take this market and will you gain market share? And I was like, bring it on, let's do it. So um, kind of got to, you know, how to really like, they're like, you're going places, like how to really, um, you know, was climbing the ladder very quickly, was the youngest person in the company to have my role. Um, but while I was listening to a podcast, because I would travel a lot, I heard uh, uh, this gentleman who owns you know, a business. I don't even remember his name anymore. I don't even remember what podcast it was. And he said, the best thing I ever did was hire virtual. And I literally, that stuck with me. And I said, virtual is truly the future. Um, so I happened to have a friend from college, Abby, that she started this like virtual company to teach people how to become virtual assistants. Um, it's called the virtual savvy. Um, and so I was like, I know nothing about virtual, but I know I have a friend that started something. I don't even know what she does, but, um, long story short, I was on a four month maternity leave with my job because, um, I had just had my second child and I said, okay, COVID just hit. Like I just had a COVID baby and I, um, want, and virtual is the future, right? And I feel like there is something inside of me that's time to move. So my husband said, Tice, why don't you just start your own company, right? Just use the virtual savvy and learn how to do it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do it. So for, I had my whole family support. So for two whole months, I grinded because I had exactly at that time, uh, two months left before I had to start working. And I pulled all nighters. I felt like, Tat, I felt like I was back in college. I was pulling all nighters. I would feed my, my one-year-old, put her back to bed, you know, and I had a three-year-old at the time too. And they would go to sleep and I would pull all nighters. I'd be working till five in the morning, uh, learning how to, I had to, all the processes and procedures in place. Because I said, if I start a business, I'm going to start something I absolutely love, right? And to have something I absolutely love, I can only focus on what I love doing. So I'm going to have to build a team to make this happen. And we're going to have to have processes and procedures in place. So I was like, we need to make this happen. So I spent I was like all nighters studying, pull, uh, like, how do I need to do this? Doing marketing, all of these things getting set. And pretty much I started to just go after anyone that was breathing and had a business. <laughs> if you had a business and you breathed, I was like, Hey, I would pitch anything to you. Hey, yeah, we can do this for you. We can do this for you. We can do this for you. Right. Because My background, I did a ton of business stuff. So I was like, we can help you with this, 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 um, so that's kind of how it all started. And I just started, uh, I launched the business. And then five months later, I resigned from my corporate career. And um, I said, hey, do you want to work with us? You can work with me, but you would have to do it uh, through my company. And uh, they said, yes, but that story is kind of crazy too. I don't know if we want to get into that one, but that was a whole crazy little story there. It was pretty fun though. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you've been at this for a bit now. Um, what have you learned? Yeah. So I've learned that I absolutely love what I'm doing. Like, you know how people say you can literally wake up in the morning and love what you do. Um, that's literally my story right now. So there's definitely moments and days that I'm like, I, I like, oh man, this is hard. Or am I doing this right? Or am I meant to do this? There's absolutely those moments. But right now in the season that I'm in, I am in the season of like, I absolutely love this business. I love our team. I love the partners that we're working with. I love helping amazing roofers and we love this roofing industry. So right now, um, it's, yeah, it's been amazing just to see, um, yeah, just to f learn more about roofing and learning how we can better support the industry. It's been amazing. Sure. sure. I mean, just give people an idea what your footprint is and, you know, what your activities are, anything that sort of gives an idea of um, what you've sort of scaled this thing out to. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the biggest things when I built the business, right, and I was going after anyone that breathed and had a business, I realized that I'm not a, I'm not like a Walmart. I'm not a target. I'm not for everyone, right? Like that's not going to be the best thing for a business. So the best thing was to niche down to a market that we really liked and to provide a service that the market really needs. And we realized that, hey, in uh, the roofing industry, right, this is 
we love working. We, we got a roofer client and we absolutely loved working with them. We loved pulling their permits. We loved doing their administration for them. And we're like, okay, this is a client that we love. So let's work with roofers. So we learned all things administrative for roofers from, um, you know, pulling a lien because someone didn't do a payment from pulling permits, scheduling inspections to um, literally helping with uh, so many things that we help uh, roofers with. And uh, we just, that's what we do. So we've literally built an amazing team that is extremely high caliber um, that helps roofers. Um, and the cool part of this whole story is that when I was in my corporate career, I had, um, I was out getting the sales and I had a right-hand person. And that person was Maria McMillan. And Maria McMillan, she would run my multi-million dollar project. So she would make sure. So I was like getting business, loving people, you know, bringing them on. Maria McMillan was making sure that we executed every project with excellence from beginning to end. She was making sure logistically all things were going well and perfect. Well, when I started my business, Maria, um, you know, I was like, Maria, you should start your own business. And, and she was like, oh, yeah, you know, a uh, long story short, Maria said, Hey, I want to come with you. Like you're going places. And I've always wanted to come with you. And I'm like, really, this is really cool. Maria McMillan is now our chief operation officer. And she was, I've been with her. We knew each other from college and then ended up in, you know, the same career together. And, um, she's now our COO. And I always say she makes the, you know, she her and along with our amazing team is we like what elevates the experience of the client. Very, very high caliber individuals on our team helping roofers with a lot of. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you knew her in college and yeah. did she work at other companies? She worked at the last company with you? Yes, she did. So she was she the there company. before you or after at the same no, time? No, she was there after. So it was just all things just came. And I didn't even tell her about what company I was in. It just one day she happened to come into an interview and I was like, oh my gosh, we know each other. And we were there for like eight years together. And um, at the last two years, she became my right hand. And so um, very cool story. So we're very, we understand each other so well. And I always say, to build a great company, you need great people, um, very talented, gifted, and let them do their magic. And she's really a huge magic for our company. Yeah. How do you approach um, scaling out your team? Because obviously to, to keep that team and um, healthy and the new people coming in, um, how do you make sure that the continuity is there? So I, so it's been, so it's been really interesting. We've actually never had to go and put a, an ad to hire anyone. Literally, we've built a culture within our company that people love working with us, that they keep bringing on more people. So when we're like, hey, we need five new people, they're like, I know someone, I know someone. And so they, and, and I always tell the team, I say, bring only people, like tell us about people that if this was your company. And then I say, wait, it is your company that you would be so proud to have them work with you. And, um, and that's worked. We've literally scaled great, like with, you know, we're almost at 47 team members and everyone on our team has just been recruited by one another. So that's how we get people. It's been pretty cool. That's awesome. Now, um, anything sort of, um, I mean, uh, uh sort of, practice wise that people can take with them that you do to show people that you care about your people or anything that sort of um, tangibly they can take away and maybe apply for their own companies? Yeah. So I'm very straightforward with uh, our team, right? I say, Hey, um, you're here because you're gifted, you're talented, and you're great at what you do. Right. Um, so I always say I, from the beginning of when I started my company, I said, great companies, a lot of owners start their business and they want to be the know-it-all. And I always tell people, I'm like, I don't know it all. That's why I bring amazing people that are more intelligent, more gifted. They are better than me. And they're the ones doing this, you know, running the business. And I get to be the one kind of almost the gatekeeper to see who we bring in, right? So I let them uh, who are gifted in administration, who have these great ideas to really feel and know that they have a voice in our company. So if they have ideas that would better, you know, our processes and procedures where they're able to say that and communicate that. So we give people range to do their magic. Like we tell them, this is what you need to do. This is what we want done. And then we just let them do it. And we don't have to, uh, we're not about micromanaging because if we have to micromanage someone, they're not the right fit for our team. And so um, I also all about accountability. So I'm like you, every single person, you have to own your tasks, right? So we don't have someone always like, uh, we don't like, 
someone always overseeing everything because then that's just like micromanaging their work. And then I always say people kind of half ass they're like, ah, oh, I didn't catch it. Well, so-and-so will catch it, right? Um, and so we're like, don't, like everyone is responsible for their role. And if you do it wrong, you just tell us that you did it wrong and we'll you know, come alongside you and help you. But if it's become something often, then we need to take a step and you got to go. So I always tell people very straight up forward when we have our meetings, I'm like you're here because you're great. Um, if you weren't good, you wouldn't be here. And um, they know that. So you just Absolutely. keep people accountable. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's been a whirlwind. You're growing. Um, if you had to go back and, and give yourself some advice, um, what would you, what would you say to, you know, um, yourself, uh, a few years ago? I would say, um, to myself a few years ago. So I feel like I maybe took too long to take this leap. Right. Um, and I always, like uh, I always battled internally because this, if you're made for this, usually you're battling the, what the world's telling you to do. Right. So the world tells us this really it's about the comfort it's about your 401k it's about your all these benefits which are really really good right and everyone's I feel like that's for a lot of people um but inside of me I've always had that struggle I was like it's time for me to go it's time for me to go so if I could kind of go back a little bit I would say don't be so scared and just do the jump like you gotta face uh you know face the fear um but that's what I would have done Mm -hmm. mm. And you, you talked about it was inside of you. I mean, for people that are just listening to this, I mean, are there any other signs that they should maybe go? Like you said, you know, listen to your internal voice, but is there any other indications or hints that someone, you know, may be ready to do this, um, you know, uh, and make that jump? Yeah. So one thing I would really recommend is read right? So there is great books out there for you to read. And um, one of the books that I highly recommend is The E-Myth by Michael E. Gerber. And I loved The E-Myth because when I was reading it, right, a lot of people are reading the book and they're like, oh man, I'm really not an entrepreneur. What I really am is an expert at, let's say, making pies, right? Let's say you're really good at making a pie and everyone talks about, oh my gosh, open your own pie store. Like it's going to be really great. Well, you open it, but you just love making pies, but you don't love the other things. You don't like the marketing, the logistics, the, you know, all of the things that come with owning a business. Um, and so that's what happens to a lot of business owners. They open a business because they're experts at what they do, right? Like I'm an expert at roofing. Um, but then when they open their business, they they shut down really quickly because they realize they hate everything else that's involved in owning a business. So I would highly recommend read the E-Myth. Um, and for me, when I read the E-Myth, I just was confirmed even more that I'm truly an entrepreneur. I was like, yes, yes, yes. I love this. I love this. Right. And when I had another friend read it, she was like, oh no, that's not me. I don't like this. Like, I don't know. This is really not, this is more of like the, the way that I want to go. Um, so I highly recommend read the E-Myth and, um, it can definitely bring some confirmation to if this is really something that is for you or something that might not be for you. Awesome. Now, um, you're busy, you have a lot going on, but do you have any hobbies or things to do to sort of break away and, and, and take a breath? Yes. So my husband is, we live in West Palm Beach, Florida. So it's about an hour and a half from Miami. And we love um, going to Miami. My husband is from Miami. And so we actually are members to the Frost Museum. And so we go there a lot with our kids. We have a four-year-old and a one-year-old. And so that's kind of our getaway. We love taking some adventures, going to the Frost Museum or, you know, going and visiting new places, new parks. So family time is huge for me. And that's also one thing why I love having my business because I get to really have more time with my family. So it's really great. Very cool. Love it. Is there anything that um, I did not cover that you wanted to uh, chat about? Um, I think you covered some great things. I, yeah, I think you covered some great things. And if you're, you know, if you're itching and you're like, I, I want to maybe pursue my business, I would say don't, uh, yeah, yeah, read the e-myth. And um, if it's for you, just do it. It's going to be scary, but it's so worth it. Sounds good. All right. Well, Thais, thanks for uh, sharing your story. Of course. Thanks so much.